Okay. This is the screen of the Yep. Really. Okay. It's only viewing. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, because that's. People can come and look at that later. No, that's okay. Yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah. Oh. Okay. All right. No worries. Fine. <laughs> All right. I've just had instruction on how to talk into the microphone. Yeah. Uh, more, more lively. Oh, thanks. This is my family over here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So we might um, start start again. Um, do you have another presentation after this? So. Oh, okay. Do I have to? We're just going to start again, yeah. Um, so so uh, this is just a uh, uh, this is a talk about the uh, Marceline, the new Wi-Fi robot, and uh, Marceline is the the model name. Uh, Marceline is sitting over here. This is the pr prototype Marceline. So this is the first time um, any group has ever ever seen the Marceline robot. So this is a, uh, a uh, kind of a uh, world exclusive world first. So um, uh, OK. Where's Mariano? <laughs> that oh okay i tried okay thank you thanks um okay so uh this uh slide is a bit wrong um uh so the we won't do the first things but uh i'll talk i'll talk about uh, uh problems with robots in the classroom and the new marceline robot um I, last time i gave a talk i said made the bold statement that Wi-Fi was invented so that we can connect robots to the internet. And then somebody f from the audience said that that was in preparation for the singularity just before the robots take over. Um, so, so a new robot, so why, why does the world need a new educational robot? Um, so, so for me, I, I'm passionate about um, robotics and um, for coding and STEM education. Um, and I've, studied all the robots that are available and I do do love what's on offer out there um, uh, some really fantastic fantastic stuff uh, but there are still various problems and various pain points with uh, the different products um, and uh, some of it is to do also with support um, for cu curricula uh, a lot of it is or well, some of it is that so um, so I, just, I, I have shared these, this uh, information before, but it's good to look back at what um, I've heard people say. So these are comments that I've actually received from people, um, educators who, who are using these kinds of products in the, in the classroom. So uh, batteries are the bane of our existence. So nobody wants to go searching for, for fresh batteries. Um, doesn't work with Scratch. Python is good, um, has to move around for students to be interested and engaged. Um, Lego robotics is too expensive. Um, somebody said I bought Lego because somebody said it was cool and it's just sitting in the cupboard. Uh, USB connectors on Lego break, is that right, John? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, if it doesn't look cool or cute, then the students will not warm to it. I don't. I don't want to have to buy extra sensors to plug on. I just want it to come in the box, um, and I want it to be intuitive. These are just sort of things that are are obvious in a way, but the, these are things that just people have been saying. So, um, uh, if if students can take the robot home, they will learn more. Um, we don't want to install anything on the school network. Our school Wi-Fi does not work. Um, I've heard this. Uh, I hear this every now and again. Our school Wi-Fi doesn't work. So, 
Um, you should have in-app purchases. Uh, you should tap into the natural competitive of kids have leveling up and competitions. Um, that was a venture capitalist, by the way, yeah. Um, I want to teach coding, not robot construction. So this was from somebody who wanted to teach coding. They didn't want to have to like do the build of the robot um, before they could start using it. Uh, <clears throat> lots of students use the same robots and we don't have time to build the robots. I run coding classes and I just want robots that are portable and ready to go. Um, uh, that, that comment actually came from Nicola from Code Rangers, um, who, who has some robots in her courses. Uh, kids should be able to drive it with remote control and then they can use Scratch to program it. So, so that's just some of the things that I've heard people say. Um, so uh, what am I doing about it? Um, so I've, um, we've come up with this um, product. Um, it's actually leveraging some fantastic work from a somebody who I consider to be a genius who uh, who's developed a product a product called Mirobot, which is also a, a drawing robot, um, and uh, he's uh, open sourced his work and um, and uh, our intention is to open source what we do here as well, so that we can. Um, uh, so that we can continue to share um, what we what we uh, what we have here, and and to to stand on the shoulders of giants and and build further into the future. Um, so, what is the Marceline robot product? It's 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 a it's a robot and a robot for education, um, which has a rechargeable battery, um, works with Scratch and Python, um, curriculum support across. Uh, all of STEM related plus arts and language. So um, that's that's our intention. Um, we want to make it less expensive than Lego, um, and accessibility is a is a is a big um, is a big thing for me because we want to be able to, uh, you know, why we're doing it. We're 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 doing this so that we can um, um, give as many kids and adults as possible um, the 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 opportunity to become excited by um, technology and coding and uh, <clears throat> and and we feel this is a this is a great way to do it um, so um, uh, ready to go out of the box excellent out of the box experience. Uh, so what we intend to do for classrooms is provide a Wi-Fi box to, to help to solve the, the our Wi-Fi doesn't work problem. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the scenario there might be sort of 15 robots with a Wi-Fi box. Um, and so that the, so that it doesn't depend on school Wi-Fi. Um, so again, uh, also working with home Wi-Fi uh, and firmware updates over Wi-Fi, which is quite important um, because a lot of the, a lot of the features um, and capabilities of the robot depend on the firmware, and um, it's nice to uh, be able to for everybody to be able to have access to the to the improvements in the in the firmware. Um, <clears throat> uh, Draws with Crayola markers. Um, which I reckon are fantastic, and uh, so uh, I mean, uh, drawing, drawing, being able to draw teaches so many aspects of um, uh, different um, different areas across the curriculum. For example, you know, um, uh, geometry, uh, angles. Um, uh, uh, you know that 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 kind of thing. So, and uh, so the 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 prototype is here, and um, we are intending to release the product um, uh, and taking orders over the next few days. Um, so, so this is what the prototype looks like, and we can have a look at the prototype um, uh, later on after um, 
after Pip's given her her talk, and uh, um, you can kind of see there's a uh, uh, there's a there's a there's a Crayola marker that there's a, like a quick change mechanism where you can pull out one pen and put in another pen, and uh, so the pen pen moves up and down, and um, there is a various interesting features there are some sensors um uh bump sensors light sensor temperature sensor um that kind of thing which can teach kids various aspects of um uh of stem you know such as data logging and graphing and that kind of thing um so i'll run run the robot in a minute but uh it's all about the hats so uh uh, we think it's important for kids to be able to make hats for their robots. Uh, uh, just to put, that's that's my lame attempt at, a, at making a hat for the robot. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's important for the kids to be able to uh, name their robots and make hats for their robots. I think. Um, so uh, this is uh, kind of the um, the the what the the scratch um, interface looks like so you can kind of see um uh there are all the basic things you can do there's the normal scratch things plus also plus uh all the um the robot um controls there as well um that's probably a bit small to see um and python as well so um so again this is leveraging from the miro bot um stuff that's done in the uk and um, that all works with um, Marceline as well. Um, and that's the, I forgot to say, that's the name of our company, One Million Robots, um, Proprietary Limited. And uh, uh, it's a company that my wife and I have started. Um, my, my wife, Irina, is a, is a uh, ex-school ex teacher and um, we'll be working together on... Um, developing some fantastic materials and fantastic products for um for um for education um and i think so what i'll do is i'll i'm not sure if it's best to uh maybe i'll just stick a uh, a marker in i'll turn the robot on uh maybe i'll just give a really quick um put a pen in and Um, and uh, the the you can connect to the to the um, to the robot directly through Wi-Fi. It's a, it's actually w working as a web server at the moment, so it's actually serving up a web page to this computer, which you can't see, uh, but you can come and have a look at later. And if I just uh, um, uh, if I just press the, I need to connect to the robot first. I'm just looking through a web browser now. And so what I'm just telling the robot to do is uh, put its pen down, move forwards by 300 millimetres, turn left by 110 degrees, move forwards by 90, 90 millimetres and turn right 20 degrees. So if I click run, so it's put its pen down, um, hopefully it's not going to fall on the floor, rotating around. And you can have a closer look later, but basically um, you can see there's there's um, some really um, cool um, graphics on here, which um, uh, is intended to sort of um, uh, reinforce some of the concepts of, uh, of angles and... Um, and also distance and and circumference as well. So, and um, something. Oh, sorry. Something which you may notice is that the angles. So when the when the robot is moving forwards, 
the wheel is rotating this way and uh, on the other side it's rotating the same way but the mirror image so angles uh, on the the right side of the robot um, the angles uh, are increasing as they go anti-clockwise and on the something kind of kind of interesting so um, and I think uh, so that's all I really wanted to to show you um, at the moment and uh, come and have a look come and have a play um, at the at the end of the presentation and um, uh, give me any feedback um, uh, tell me what you think yeah sure yep yep so Um, anyway, as you, as you play with it uh, um, later on, you can um, make it do different things that spin around and so on. And also, you can um, change the colours and uh, and it and it beeps and things like that. You can make tell it to beep. Um, okay, so um, that concludes my presentation. So thank you for thank you for listening. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think we. Um, should we have a break or should we just should we just go on? Oh, any question? Like, happy to take questions. Um, so, um, so so we do so we do do have a a, a kind of a package which is uh, price for schools and what we're trying to do. Um, particularly with the first 50 units that are in production now, is to try to bundle them with um, workshops um, or um, like either teach development or kids workshops. We want to make them available to kids straight away so we can, um, with the first 50 units, what we're really trying to do is get as much um, user feedback as possible um, because we're following this idea of don't trust the product, trust the user. Um, we don't know at the moment whether the product is um, too much or not enough or or whatever. So, um, so, so the the pricing model we have sort of bundles workshops in with um, uh, with the with the complete robot hardware, and uh, sort of runs at about two hundred and fifty dollars for a for a um, for a robot. And and a workshop and workshop included, yeah. So it's sort of around that price point. We we want to we want to make the robots as accessible as possible. So we're working on trying to get the price lower and lower. But um, obviously, to make the first 50 robots, it's been qu quite expensive, and uh, uh, that's just the price point we we're at at the moment. So yep. <clears throat> okay. Um, in, in a perfect world, what would be your best case scenario in terms of how teachers or students might use your robot? What is it, for example, that they would learn or play around with? So, so, what, so the way, um, so, so what I what I see is that um, robots have application in um, across a whole range of curricula, not just not like, not just okay, let's learn, you know some aspect of coding um, it, it it can it, it moves through all of not not just all of stem as well so so we have obviously science um, where you might um, use the sensors to um, investigate um, some kind of um, uh, you know take temperature measurements or um, uh, or light measurements um, uh, and and and, and sort of learn some of those things. Um, I, I should also say, like, the age group we're uh, trying to understand most is eight to twelve years old um, at the moment. So um, uh, it's uh, that's at a point where you can um, sort of reinforce um, or or introduce, in some cases, uh, you know, concepts of measurement, graphing, data logging, that kind of thing, which are all a part of part of science. Um, uh, 
so, so, so I see it's sort of going across a whole range of curricula. So obviously mathematics is, is, is one, one of those, um, uh, teaching kids about, uh, geometry angles, um, um, and that kind of thing. And, uh, there are also other areas of curriculum, uh, including English, um, where you can, where the, where the, where the robots can be actual, um, uh, uh, characters in in st storytelling situations as well. So um, you, can, you, can, you can kind of think of um, ways to introduce robotics into into um, areas of the curricula where you wouldn't normally say, okay, let's put a robot in here, kind of thing, into you know to teach some um, teach some kind of um, uh, you know you know class or or whatever. Mentioned role playing, yep. so maybe get the robots to play theater. You've got yeah, exactly. I mean, conversation uh, I mean, somehow. Um, they have speakers. Or exactly. I mean, um, you know, um, they could be um, actors in a uh, you know a Shakespearean play, or um, you know something like that. You know, each each robot, and and the kids are learning so much about um, not only. Shakespeare, but also about like how you know they're sort of sneakily learning other things as well about how to how to make ro robots do things and um, you know my things was also I wanted it to be able to do design uh, for art or sort of a design element as well. That was art as well, yeah. to add on art as well, looking at music as well. If there's a speaker available on that, that will be really great potential to make that robot dance and something that musical teachers or even any even primary school teacher where we have to cover all KLAs, you can integrate all that sort of areas in one with maybe get that to dance. So I'm just saying maybe and in terms of art as well, looking at Lego, looking at putting things together, maybe something you can Probably add something on top of it. I know you don't want to break it, but oh, no, um, I'm all for adding things. But um, hats, yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah, just kind of yeah. <laughs> I can see a potential with this. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Um, um, in my background, I'm in the public library, so I run Korean Club Public Library. It would be great to kind of look at um, bring that into libraries and children's programs as well, just to have fun, maybe with hands-on robotics and of, co of course there's a demand and need around um, bringing robotics and technology within school programs but there's not many things out there i know there's a lot of ideas out there but it's just hard for public libraries to lock in or get into which one that's probably the best for the library and what's and whether that will go for a long period of time that's the thing i just okay yeah th thanks for those comments yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, no, yeah, that, that's yeah, fantastic. I mean, libraries are uh, the perfect places for the kids to come and experience th these kinds of things where they might not otherwise. So, um, yeah, Sorry, I, okay, I had a, yep. I had a um, comment as well. I, I just thought it might be good if uh, if you could attach uh, you know, Lego bricks to them, oh, if you would okay. make them compatible, you know, with Lego stuff, and uh, um, so that'll that'll sort of you know work well with all the other other uh, sort of yeah it's it's a it's a um i think that uh, i think that's an interesting comment i think we'll uh it's not a it's not something we've included straight away but it'll be interesting to uh no um uh there there are well actually i'm, I'm not 100 percent sure whether you whether you license the it's kind of an interface in a way um to go they go bricks i don't know right my experience is that you probably can't use the word itself but um you might be able to get away with the actual pieces seem to fit Right. But, well, then again, Edison robots use the terminology, so I wonder how they get around it. Yes. So. 
maybe by saying Lego compatible or something like yeah, that. But possibly, yeah, possibly, that's okay. Yeah, it's interesting, yes. So we're not sort of trying to go to, with this product, we're not sort of trying to go towards the let's build something, um, try to build, uh, you know, build features of the robot. Um, it's It's more of a like here it is ready to go, let's do something with it as it is kind of thing without, yeah, it's kind of what we're trying to address that that part of the market rather than the, the Lego build thing, which Lego does extremely well. Um, and so, but uh, yeah, th thanks for the, thanks for the, that comment. Yep. Amazing achievement, you know, just being able to create a robot. I know that this was your idea a few months ago and actually have it here on display. I, I, feel I think quite, I spoke to John about six months ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I feel quite privileged that uh, I'm witnessing your first ever launch of it. It's quite an achievement to design and, and have it produced. It's, and to say that you, you got it available for sale for the next few days is incredible. So congratulations to you, you and your much. wife and your family. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks Thanks so much. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, okay. Are there any other questions? Does it need calibration in terms of telling it to turn 90 degrees, et cetera, or even to go forward 30 centimetres? It doesn't need calibration. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a the, – the motors themselves are geared stepper motors, um, so they have an inherent um, uh, accuracy to them. Um, there is a there is there is a there, there, there is a kind of a one time calibration that happens in in in, in firmware, but um, the user never the user never sees that. So um, so there's no calibration. Um, calibration, I think, is would raise itself as a primary pain point for anybody that uses a, any, anything that needs to be calibrated. I know Miro, Miro, the Mirobot product, which I've mentioned from the UK. Um, which is an absolutely fantastic product, um, does need pen calibration, which is so painful. Um, so this doesn't need it. The, the markers go in and out. The accuracy is there. Um, uh, it's just kind of ready to go. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of calibration. And I don't think anybody else would be. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's no calibration with Makey Makey. Um, yeah, that's good. That's a good thing. Um, yeah. So, was that a question or? Yeah. Oh, uh, collaboration. Um, it's interesting. One of my first concepts um, was actually incorporating Makey Makey into the product as well, um, so that you could imagine. I'm not, I'm not sure I should. That, that it was probably a little bit over the top, but I um, thought about incorporating a makey makey into the product. Um, um, but that's interesting that you make that that point um, about somehow trying to do a collaboration with makey makey. Yeah. So thanks for that comment. I'll yeah. It's interesting. Interesting. Thanks. Yep. Any more? Matthew's giving me. Are there any more questions before? Before we move on. So I think with that, uh, so thanks everybody and and uh, I think we'll we'll uh, pass on to the wonderful Pip Cleaves. Um, I might use my teacher voice. Do you need to do you need for recording? Yeah. All right, I use it for recording then. No, no, don't give me the Madonna thing. All right. So, um, hi, my name's Pip Cleaves. I'm the new teacher training manager at Code Club Australia. And I come here via doing lots to do with education around technology integration and professional learning of teachers around why we should be using technology in the classroom. And when I was first 
mentioned that I might like to do a presentation tonight. I thought, but I don't know what to tell these guys. I'm used to talking to teachers. So any teachers in the room, thank you for being the, the voice of reason to me. But for those that I'm not used to, I thought what I might do is talk about the new digital technologies curriculum. So across the whole of Australia now, the Australian Curriculum Assessment Reporting, ACARA as we call them, have um, decreed that we will teach technology, we teach coding from kindergarten right through to year eight as mandatory. So every single student will learn coding from kindergarten right through to year eight and then as an elective in year nine and ten. And that has a huge impact on the people who walk into your doors, the people who you work with and what they're actually coming out with. So it's we can all talk about the robots and talk about technology, but what does the government say the students have to be able to do by the end of each age group. So I thought I'd just quickly run through that to show you a little bit of a continuum of where we're at with it. So first of all, it's called the Digital Technologies Curriculum and it's split into two components, which I absolutely adore. And the first is the design and technologies area. And this subject, if you like, is, like, is all about design thinking, innovating problems that exist in the universe, looking at sustainability, looking at the, like food, how to grow food well, how to be sustainable in the environment, how to bring about innovation in the world that we live in and a process by which to do that. So we're going to be learning how to do design thinking from kindergarten. So by the time they get through to year 10, they're done and they have their project management structure, which is something I think they haven't had up until now. The second component is the technologies. And the technologies is about systems and knowledge, it's about processes, and it's also about coding. So there's a bit of a continuum of coding that we're going to be working with. Now, at the moment, today, in Australia, it is mandatory for all students in Western Australia, Victoria, Queensland, South Australia, Northern Territory and Tasmania to learn coding. New South Wales has currently produced a draft syllabus and it will be combined with science in a science and technology subject at this stage. That's being fast-tracked. I've never seen a syllabus be pushed through so quickly. So that will be out very soon. So I'm teaching, currently teaching at university, teaching second year teaching students how to do coding in preparation for three years time when they leave because that's where they're going to be doing. So it will be here, so don't stress. Now, at kindergarten level, kindergarten to year two or foundation to year two as we call it, it's all about parts, purpose and exploration. So there's been this sort of fear that students don't, they're getting locked into the tablet world where they don't know which device to use for which purpose. So starting from kindergarten, talking about components of a computer, how to use a camera to take a photo rather than just picking a tablet up, how to understand the mouse and the keyboard and all things like that. Um, sorry, just go through here, the actual skill areas. So they're going to learn things like how to use robotic toys. So this is, there's um, some examples I'll show you in a minute, but there's a beautiful one called Cubetto, which is a wood-based block, yep, for coding. So it's starting with basics like that. It's choosing the right system to choose it for the task at hand. It's not about one device fits every use in technology because we know that's not the case. So it's about starting to break down and understand what things are for. And simple algorithms. So how do you how making a sandwich or making our cereal in the morning is a process and that is an algorithm in life. So starting to understand those simple flows and processes. And yes, there's apps and things out there, but what I love at this level is this is an unplugged computer science knowledge. So they're starting to understand you don't always need computers to understand computational thinking and to start understanding how computers work. When we head into, so a sample project they might do is that they have to direct a person or as an on object, such as a robot, in a simple visual program to navigate a path. So we might take something like the bear hunt, you know, the famous bear hunt story, turn that into an algorithm and students have to draw and plot the arrows to move through the forest and head back home again. So it's about tying in different subject areas into the learning of technology. And that's the most important thing. So for many teachers, this is a change in what we've been doing. So we have to work with our teachers and support our teachers to move this place. Well, so they're beginning to plan things and think about that process, that design process. We don't just dive in and do it. We plan first and structure our way through. Then when we head into, so some of the things we're going to be doing, Scratch Junior, 
is um, is is an area we might blockly code is an area we might play with. Um, codable hopscotch are all environments that are welcoming to the early years students. Um, hardware, we've got Cubeto, we've got the B-Bots, you know, those little things, the yellow and black things that show. Yesterday at uni, we spent about an hour with all our students playing with those and thinking about how they can use them. Edison, Dash and Dot, Cubelets, dare I say, Marceline might pop in that list as well soon. So Dash and Dot's an interesting one as well, but these are all based on starting to understand the block code environment. We then move into years three and four. And years three and four is exactly where you're working with, right? That sort of age. And we're looking at coding and hardware and different systems. So some of the different um, skills that they're going to have to know, so by the time they say eight, um, is following and creating algorithms with branching. So we're going to start heading into that upper level from a simple set of instructions to some branches. Project management skills, using peripherals, plugging things in. As we know, if we stick to one device, we can't use plugins. It's important to electronic microscopes. One of my friends who's a year four teacher, he is always picking up insects in the playground and taking them back into his classroom and digging into the digital microscope to have a look at them and, and talking about them. So using things with, it, with your computers. Project management, that basic, again, that flow, beginning to understand the processes, designing solutions using visual coding languages, and of course, collecting, manipulating and interpreting, interpreting data. This is my weak point, so I'll probably skip this quite a bit, okay? But one of the strands we study is all about data. So they start from collecting data, collecting, visualising it, data security, and then working with networks and data by the time they're in about year seven and eight. So there's that whole strand of how to work with it. I'll probably stick clear of that for most of my life. All right, so in the sample project might be create an interactive guessing game using visual programming language. So that might be an actual project that a student who's about a nine-year-old would be doing, nine to 10. And they're going to define the problem. So beginning to understand user experience, beginning to think about that process of empathising, that getting all that information before we start solutioning. Um, moving into explaining how the solution meets the purpose and the answer and perhaps even, dare I say, playing with prototypes and beginning to understand that process and failing lots. And describing how learning software is used at home, school and within the community. So what sort of software? This is actually a really busy two years. And I think this is where there's going to be a huge shift for teachers and a huge shift in what we're doing in schools, just by the list here. And that's, you can, we've got our environments already created for us, the Made With Codes and the Code.orgs and the, and the Grok Learnings that are nice little entry point for those to begin their, begin their understanding, not just, and then heading into Things like your Ozo Blockleys, and if you're, you know, with Marceline, with the scratch coding, that's the example of what we're doing at this age. Minecraft, with the new education Minecraft, it's a really safe environment for teachers to be able to watch and nurture their students and make sure they're all having an awesome learning time. Some hardwares, the Makey Makey, the Spheros, ever popular Spheros. Ozobot, Edison, Lego, we do the cubelets, which are the little boxes, all sorts of things that are always coming out. And I do fear that some of them are a little bit too perfect for me. And, and I think we need to see things that you can see inside them and they can understand what makes the, makes the robot rather than just press the buttons on top of the robot. So year five and six, increasing complexities. Anyone got a year five, a five and six year old student at home? Yeah. I reckon this is where our current year nine start. When they start this, our students that are just starting to think about going into computer science as a career and starting to head into, this is where they're at. It's all about UX design and prototyping at this stage, really getting into that collaborative project management. So not just knowing how to manage a project, but work with someone else in a collaborative space to ensure that your project's moving forward. And the more I worked with students last year in collaboration, like in projects, I just walk away and let them fail because I know that when they're in your workplace, they have to be able to work collaboratively and they have to be able to work remotely. And this is a huge skill for them to develop, I believe. Productivity skills, how to use your, your online word, like, you know, those things that we take for granted at our age, students don't necessarily know how to do word and how 
how to do PowerPoint. We have to teach them how to use them well, how to use their email management well, how to work in that space. I'm actually a disbeliever in the digital native theory because I don't believe our students are necessarily born knowing how to use things. We, they'll catch on quickly but we still have to teach them in the first instance. Okay, so yeah. File naming, absolutely. So product, file naming, yeah, that never ending documents folder, hey Nick. How many of them have you seen at school lately, right? I know. I think last year when I had a year seven student go, hey Miss, when I said, you know, I need you to insert an image into your OneNote for me. Yeah, and I said, well, you take the photo, right? And then you probably, it's on your phone, yeah? So how are you gonna get it from your phone to your computer? But my phone's not hooked up. Oh, anyway, we went through the whole process and saving it. And after that, it was such a great learning curve. I made sure every student took a photo on their phone and put it through to their OneNote for me, just so they knew that process and could do that well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right? It's a real, we have to teach people how to do these things. All right, so something a student might do at this age, they're going to work collaborative to create a maze game. See how I've got the similar theme here and it's just stepping up a level and they might define the data and functional requirements of the game. So we're getting into real hardcore business, you know, that sort of business analysis side. Yeah, yeah. Um, designing the user interface with algorithms, incorporating decision making and repetition algorithms in their designs, implementing the game in a visual programming language, still visual programming at this stage, and then evaluating how that meets the requirements we were first established. So that's quite sophisticated. If we think a 10 to 11 year old can do that by the time they finish year six, pretty cool, right? And then I got really scared when I read Year 7 and 8. Sorry. So this is what they're going to start doing at this stage. So we're going to be playing Scratch, Swift Playground, Grok Learning, Ozo Blockly, Minecraft, Creative Cloud. Then we're going to head into, you'll see we're levelling up in here into the, the, I call them the additions, so the micro bits and the sense hat. And your makey makey HoloLens, we all know developers out there for HoloLens, I think that's a space we'll all be heading. I'm seeing more and more VR in education at the moment, which I think is really exciting because all of a sudden, I'm a Japanese teacher and all of a sudden I can be in Japan looking at Japanese historical things with my students that we could never have done before. So it's really powerful. And Lego and EV3 that's always around. So year seven and eight is about creativity, problem solving, about innovation. So this is where they step into what I call really hardcore. And this is year 10. And this is where doing it still mandatory. So every student in year seven and eight has to come out knowing this stuff at the end of year eight. And that's where we're gonna see the big shift, I believe. So we got general purpose programming. So we're heading away from visual into Python, into C++. Maybe some extended kids will hang into Ruby, Ruby area. Maybe play with some JavaScript. So that's at this age of 12 and 13. So that's pretty cool, I think. Um, setting them up for real success. Really no UX and accessibility when designing. Accessibility is coming through more and more. To understand that for you guys walking into your company, surely that's a benefit that our students actually start thinking in that way. Um, create interactive apps and animations and simulations. Acquiring, analyzing, validating, evaluating various types of data. So really starting to work with that. Project management autonomy and being able to monitor their own progress within a project, know where they need to change and decomposing problems and prototyping. So that's the skills that they have to learn. And a sample project might be this. Again, it's to do with creating a game, but students create a model of a real world system and a game that will educate their peers. And it has to be done in general purpose programming. They're going to define, you can see it's kind of just explaining those different skills I mentioned. And then so some of the things they might be doing, I would say Scratch is kind of really bored by then. They're well done and dusted and they're over that. Let's just, no more Scratch. Game Fruit is a nice games creation platform out of New Zealand. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, quite like it. 
We're into Python, touch, develop, trinket, using Trinket, using the Creative Cloud and starting to get into Flash for animations, moving away from scratch and visual into how do we do this? Some of the stuff Adobe is doing at the moment and moving in is an area that our students need to know. I have a 19 year old who's doing animation, um, a Bachelor of Animation at the moment, and he just loves the explosion that he can do with creativity by heading into the creative cloud. So his peers, you know, getting into that earlier would be a good thing. Um, pro did you know every student in New South Wales Department of Ed gets a full creative cloud for free? Absolutely, to install on two computers, there you go. Um, the productivity suite, knowing how to use any productivity suite. When schools start locking themselves down to a provider, that's when there's a problem because you don't know what company that student's going to work into, walk in, which corporation. They need to have skills in the Gs and the Ms and the everythings so that they can survive no matter where they go. And Thimble, uh, something like Thimble that's got HTML and C++ and JavaScript to get students moving in that space as well. So starting to move away from the visual to what I call the hardcore coding. Um, and using things like the Microbits to Sense Hat, the Raspberry Pis, VR, AR, Lego Mindstorms and Arduino. So that's sort of the area that by the end of year eight, they should be on top of all this stuff. And then year nine and 10, way out of my comfort zone, I'll just have you know. So this is elective level. So students don't need to do this, right? So this is just the extra guys that want to move into vocational space of using this computer. So yeah, you can read that. So it's all about designing, it's about the whole design process, project management, using real coding to, and really working with data and networks as well. So it's not just the, it's the whole kit and caboodle of being a computer what scientist. The, the yes. So the other huh. Just net general, just general. Every teacher has to be aware of that. So some schools, I would say, will create specific subjects, but in primary, you don't do that. So it's every teacher's role to do this in their every role. So we're working with, um, so your different curriculum areas. The Department of Education has an area called the Future Learning Unit that are working with professional learning for teachers. Um, different curriculum areas are building syllabus. So many companies are jumping on the bandwagon with this sort of stuff. It's a real area at the moment. Yeah, the apps, you look at all the educational apps popping out, good, bad and ugly. Yeah. They are, they are. They are, and yeah. Um, and then the hardware, they're going to head into whatever the school can throw at them. I dare say these students would consume with care. Um, so that's basically what students will be able to do. So at Code Club, we're trying to start that. And any teachers in the room who don't have a code, a code club, I can help you with that. We now have 50,000 students in Australia and 1,700 clubs. So hopefully by the end, but that's still only 8% of schools. So we're hoping to beef up this year and step to our next level. So we also have now, this is exciting, we have 60 hours worth of projects that are all mapped to the digital technologies curriculum, as you call it. So all these activities tick the special teacher language of ACTD1P3 and all that sort of mapping that we have to do. So we're trying to help teachers in, in as many ways. Oak Club and that's something that I'm working with, working with teachers all the time and I love doing that so I'm looking forward to doing more of it. So you can find me on Twitter or you can find me through Code Club and um, any schools that you know would like to jump on this journey or if I can help you guys with your volunteer work please do let me know and um, I'm very excited to be part of this journey so lovely to see you all. Any questions please go for it. Yes. Bit surprised that it's an either one or the other with visual versus the. Um, uh, in fact, in some contexts, it may be learner dependent. Some people are very visual, Correct. and I've been using visual approaches in professional programming. Yes. So, yes. Um, are, are you addressing the individual learning styles? I, I would assume that teachers would be yes, and I would hope that students are able to start voicing where they feel comfortable programming as well and heading into that space. And I'm seeing more and more of the visuals are giving the option to either go visual or JavaScript within their programming platform. So I think that then gives the students the option to go that space. So yes, I think it's more of a continuum. The intent of it is the continuum. Yep. At this point. Have you thought about using Node-RED at all? I don't know that one. I'll have to, I'll have to look up on that one. 
Okay. Code red. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Of course, the most popular language for students, I actually don't know if it's a language, but program them is Unity. Gaming, yeah, yeah, gaming development. So they all want to head into that space, right? But they still have to learn the other. I have a question. Um, some of the software decisions seem a little bit arbitrary. How are they were? Uh... That's my headspace. So within the curriculum itself, it doesn't tell which one. It just says visual or um, base programming. Tram already. No, no, joking. Sorry. <laughs> the trams are here already. Woo! Sorry. <laughs> um, so I've seen a lot of really interesting projects. Uh, how are those administered? If you could tell us uh, some of the details, like can students work in groups? How much time are they given? Is like a, a term? Or a semester? On the teacher, I guess. So in my classroom, basically one project was half a term. And I would have some collaborative and some individual projects. I very much focus around 21st century skills. So I'm looking at the creative thinking, the, the critical thinking, the collaboration and communication aspects. So when I plan, I make sure I've got one or all of those, in, depending on the unit. A lot of those decisions are left to the teacher. Yeah, yeah. To, I suppose, yeah. assess the class and... Or if they go and hang out on Pinterest for a while and find a unit of work, that'll tell them how long to do it, and that's the real danger. The draft Sorry? syllabus is in the science and technology area of, it's now called NESA, New South Wales Education Standards Authority. Okay, all right. And we could also look at all the other Open for states? discussion. And the other states, yes. If you do a good Google, yeah. you'll find quite a lot of stuff at the moment. Yep. Um, Victoria are particularly advanced in this area. Okay, good. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so thanks, Pip, for that amazing um, talk tonight and... Uh, it's really interesting uh, to um, to get a little bit of a glimpse on uh, what students are going to be doing, um, which is uh, amazing. Let's that's right. Let's all go back to school. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, I think we'll uh, close 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 off there for tonight. So, so thanks again for everybody for coming along, and uh, it's been a great combined. Code Club and Sydney Ed Robotics uh, meet up and uh, hope we can do it again. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's 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 do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So thanks everyone. Thanks for and thanks again to Atlassian for hosting this uh, amazing um, uh, amazing space and for the for the for the food and drinks as well. So thank you so much. And um, feel free to come and play with the robot and. Uh, Whatever, yeah. <laughs> okay.